We're doing a, a, something that might be a little bit out of the ordinary today. Uh, we're, we've got guest speakers who aren't lawyers. <laughs> um, one of the trends, and the reason we, we asked them to come and speak to, to you, is one of the trends we're seeing is that more and more plan administrators are offering plan participants um, education about their existing retirement plans so they can make more informed decisions about their retirement options. And this, this includes obviously more information in defined contribution plans that provides more investment uh, educational opportunities so participants can make more informed decisions about investments. But increasingly, many employers are also using um, independent financial advisors to help employees with lifestyle as well as uh, financial issues. And um, I just want to say in terms of using, uh, there's a lot of providers out there. And in terms of using providers, we also have sometimes used um, this kind of service provider when we settle class actions and we want a way of implementing the settlement. Uh, because we need to talk to the people in the class about the benefits and about what's happening. And frankly, I've just found this kind of service to be extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and it's always better when the plaintiffs feel very good about the settlement they've just entered into. Um, and f as an example, uh, three or four years ago, we settled uh, some class lit litigation between a city and its transit union. And when we had to go and explain the settlement, the, um, the union, we got the union to actually hire a group that, that provided this kind of service. And um, I can tell you that those sessions were so successful that the city, uh, after this was all over, decided to rehire uh, the provider in order to provide uh, sort of quarterly um, sessions of the same sort to its existing employee base. They saw, they saw the benefit of it. Um, it might be argued in some situations that this might be used as a way of uh, satisfying your fiduciary obligations. We're not, we're not saying that that's necessarily the case. It may. Like many things in the law, it sort of depends on the circumstances. But the decision to hire um, a financial or uh, lifestyle planner uh, in connection with your employee benefits is itself a fiduciary decision that you're making as administrator of your plan. So the usual constraints that go around that apply. You need to make sure that these are, uh, uh, that, the, that the quality is high and that they're delivering uh, the right um, the right information. Um, of course, the main advantage of using um, independent advisors who don't receive commissions or fees that are either tied to a particular investment or tied to the amount of products that they're going to work to sell to your employees um, is, is, is usually a good thing um, if they're not representing an insurance company or a bank or a mutual fund or, or something of that sort. Um, there, as I said, there's lots of good providers out there, uh, and they range uh, in all, all sorts of sizes. Uh, Morneau Chappelle, for example, is a very large benefits consulting firm in Canada, and they, they provide this service. Um, and then um, there's, a, there's a woman, Marilyn Lertz, who wasn't here today, but she's sometimes at, at our events, and uh, she has a company called Linmar, and she's just the sole provider of these kinds of services. She's very good. In fact, she's the one that provided the services to the city that I was talking about. And then also we have those that are in the middle and those that do a very good job. And um, so what we're here to do is welcome uh, one of those providers and give you a sense of what it is that they, they kind of do. So first, I guess I'm going to introduce Frank. Sure. Frank Stanley. I have you with us as well. Uh, yep. Um, Frank is the author of this book, How to Eat an Elephant, um, Achieving Financial Success One Bite at a Time. Uh, he's the uh, CEO of Employee Financial Education Division and author of the, well, he's author of that book I just pointed out. He's a certified financial planner, a fellow of the Canadian Securities Institute, and a fellow of the Financial Planning Standards Council. And his colleague, Av Lieberman, who's just over here, wave Av, or he's coming up. Good, excellent. Um, in January of uh, 1996, founded the Retirement Education Center and began to develop a program of life management. 
of Life Management, which combined lifestyle transition planning and pre-retirement education into a truly unique package. And I, I remember um, Av, Av and I, I think, met in the late 90s, about the time you were starting this up, you weren't so sure that it was going to get off the ground. And right. I, I, I like to think that I helped to encourage you to, yes, you did. to move forward with it. And because uh, um, I think it's, it's an extremely useful service, and we're really happy that um, Av and Frank could come and speak to you. So, gentlemen, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, sticking around. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. First off, I want the gentleman who asked that long question and long answer from Randy to get a copy of this book. So if you haven't got it, I believe it's just oh, over here. There you go. Thank you. So Av and I are here today to talk with you a little bit about how transition planning and financial education can help solve some of the challenges uh, and communication issues that may be facing the pension um, and your company when you're talking to your employees about your pension. And we all have some of these. Let me see, grab one of these. I'm going to do a little interactivity to uh, get your thoughts and uh, perspectives on some areas of that. You're probably wondering what these ancient cell phones are doing on the, on the uh, table. Um, but just to get you started, so you're familiar with them, we're going to get a question going here. To start with, there's a small power button in the very bottom corner here. Okay, so you just need to power it up and then you can just leave it powered up for the rest of this presentation. Once you've powered it up, then you're, the questions are going to come up on the screen and you see here one, two, three, four. Um, so you'll answer the questions by putting in one, two, three, or four, choose one, and then press the send button. The send button is just up above. Okay, and we'll display the results of the thoughts and opinions of the audience and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the presentation. So to get you using them right off the bat, let's ask this question. What percentage of companies believe employee financial education will benefit the company? So you've got a series of answers there. One is 3%, two is 44%, uh, three is 72%, and four is 100%. So if you've already cheated and looked at some of the uh, uh, graphics, yeah, I <laughs> see this gentleman here. He's uh, taking a peek to see if he can get the answer. Um, we did surveys of hundreds of companies and we've done surveys of thousands of employees and asked their thoughts and opinions around personal finance and financial education in the workplace. And when we did that, we came back with these results. So I'll ask you to enter your response uh, and we'll close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. Can we have the responses up? Okay, so most of you have been cheating. No, <laughs> I see that, yeah. Um, a number of you think 44%, so yeah, it's not surprising we get a mix in the middle there. The actual answer to this when we surveyed companies is 72% of companies believe that an employee financial education program will benefit the company. So whether that be in the form of increased productivity of the employees or whether that be uh, in the overall communications and participation and benefits or uh, the overall bottom line of the company. Interestingly, when we asked the companies that provided financial education what their number one reason for doing that, for providing financial education, was to improve employees and companies' performance. So it's not surprising that that's a principal reason for doing it. So my partner here, Av Lieberman, he's the CEO of the Retirement Education Center. Uh, and he's going to come up in a minute and talk to you about the psychology and, uh, of retiring and transition planning and talk to you guys a little bit about that. And I'm Frank Wigginton. I'm the CEO of the Employee Financial Education Division and author of the book, as Randy said. Av and I came together because Av takes care of this, uh, has the knowledge, the, the practice and experience and the psychology and the mentality of people going through, going through a transition process, whether it be transitioning from one job into another or whether it be transitioning into retirement and out of a job entirely. Whereas I'm the money, money guy. I've got a whole bunch of designations after my name, as Randy talked a little bit about, a couple of fellowships as well, and I've been doing financial education and personal finance for the last 14 years. So before we get too deep into it, I want to talk a little bit about the needs and the wants around financial education. So the question is, do employees want 
financial, uh, do employees want financial education? Better question, do they need financial education? How many people here, right off the bat, would say the majority of employees need financial education? Show of hands, quick. Okay. So I think we all watch the news, see the headlines. Maybe some of us are experiencing it ourselves. But there is a massive need for employee financial education. One in four employees are seriously financially distressed. Okay? These employees struggle with just the day-to-day -day management of their money. Debt is likely a, a significant issue for them and trying to figure out just how to deal with and manage money. The studies have shown that people who are financially distressed are spending upwards of an hour or more every day at work dealing with their personal finances. Think about the cost to a company's productivity on that. Okay, these are the people who are financially distressed. So 25% of the workforce, you have, if you have 1,000 employees, 250 employees are spending an hour a day, so 250 hours a day are being lost in productivity. Those are only the people who are seriously financially distressed. How many of us do you think are somewhat financially distressed? A little bit. <laughs> okay. This has a huge impact. So there is a high need for companies as well as the employees to be receiving this financial education. Reality is, is two-thirds of them say they're not in control of their money. Interestingly, on the elevator ride up here this morning, very quick ride, but... Um, I saw something that said that 51% of employees were, felt they were in control of their finances. A little vague, but didn't give the details of how they arrived at that, but uh, they talked a little bit about that. But from our survey of thousands of employees, we've learned that two-thirds do not feel like they're in control of their money. That's a pretty significant number. So let's ask another question then. You got your poll, th uh, poll things ready again? What percentage of employees want their employer to provide a financial education program? Now, again, if you've been cheating, <laughs> this one's going to be a pretty easy one. But uh, is it 1, 22 percent? Is it 2, 51 percent? Is it 3, 87 percent? Or is it 4, 100 percent? What percentage of employees want their employer to provide a financial education program to the employees? We'll close that poll in 5, 4, 3, Two, one. Display the results, please. Okay, so you've learned that the, the cheat sheet is in the book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 87%. So nearly 9 out of 10 employees want their company to provide a financial education program for them. Okay. There's clearly a high need. There's clearly a high demand. So... Do you think it's something that employees, sh uh, employers should be seriously thinking about doing? Somebody here from Morneau Chappelle? Anybody here from Morneau Chappelle? Over in the corner, anybody else? One over here, okay. So you guys are spread out. So this is information that comes from Morneau Chappelle, from the EAP usage. Maybe it's Chappelle FGI, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but when looking at your EAP results, and this is something you can all do when you get back to the office, find out who communicates with Morneau Chappelle or your EAP provider, and ask to get the results from the EAP usage. In two th this is from 2008, so it's a little out of date, but it's still very relevant. The number of requests for assistance on personal finance issues from the EAP provider exceeded all other EAP requests combined. Think about that for a minute. All the other things that an EAP provider does, personal finance exceeded all other requests combined. Helpful in personal finance. Now, they weren't asking for help with trying to figure out their pension, right? The EAP provider is not a pension educator or a pension person talking about pensions. Not surprising, though, debt and credit was you know, head and shoulders above all the other issues around personal finance. So people, you know, maybe it's not for the people in this room. Maybe most of us are at a stage now in our lives where we're in better control of our finances and we've gotten past a lot of those issues and those struggles on your personal finances. Um, but think, maybe for some of you, think about your children. How do you think your children are doing with their finances? Okay? Think about some of the other areas 
with all the different employees, especially in the manufacturing areas, especially in, well, really clearly it's across the board. It really doesn't matter where it is that you work. So let me ask you another poll. What percentage of employees have not sought any financial advice in the last two years? What do you think that number is? Is it 1, 13%, 2, 51%, 3, 67%, or D, 100%? What do you think that is? What percentage of employees have not sought any financial advice in the last two years? So... When we ask this question, we say, have you talked with your uncle? Have you talked with your HR department? Have you sought advice from your EAP, from your financial advisor, from your bank person, um, from anyone? And interestingly, whoops, <laughs> can we display the results? Okay, so 67% was the number that came, uh, came up most. Well, that makes sense, right? Two-thirds of people aren't in control of their finances. So they're probably shy about getting help with their finances. The actual answer is 51%. And believe it or not, it's in your cheat sheets. Okay. <laughs> Look a little bit deeper. They're there. Um, the reality is, is that most people aren't going out to get help. Okay. Um, if people want to be financially literate, if people want to get a hold of their finances and get their finances under control, tell them to buy this book. No. Kidding, um, uh, but th that's what the book's about: is getting your finances in order. No, the the idea is is that most people don't know where to go. If they want to be financially literate, there's tons of free information online. There's tons of books out there. There's a lot of great information. So why don't more people go out and deal with this such critical, important issue that impacts not only themselves but their families and their friends? One of the big reasons is, is most people don't know where to start. They just don't know where to go, who they can trust, what they can rely on, and what to do first. So the federal government ran a task force on financial literacy, which I presented. Uh, recommendation number six is not verbatim, but very close to what I recommended to them talked about the need for an increase in financial literacy. They form, they've got the Financial Consumers Agency of Canada, which created a financial toolkit. Some of those tools very similar to and somewhat like the tools that I have. Um, and they said, here's the tools, here's the resources. So now everybody can be financially literate. Then what they did is they put it behind four or five clicks of the mouse Right, four or five pages with a lot of whole bunch of text. Okay, and then when you finally get to the page where you get to start getting the information you want about personal finance and, and finances, they say here's 27 things that you can do. You can, you know, figure out car loans and you can figure out mortgages and you can figure out life insurance and psh, right up on the screen, great big splash. Here's 27 things, and just put yourself in the mentality of somebody who's finally gotten past the anxiety of personal finances and is now at the stage where they're saying, I want to do something. They click on a page, no, no, click on a page, no, no, click on a page, no, okay, click on a page, no. And then they finally get to the page and it's 27 things. What do you think the reaction is? <laughs> ah, just too much, too, uh, too soon. And it's evident that these things really aren't working because we continuously see headlines like this where Canadians are still piling on more and more debt and more and more consumer debt at that. So we're going to use these things another time. What percentage of employees do you think want pension and benefits education? Let me ask you that. Here's a, a small hint. The answer is not in your cheat sheets. <laughs> so you have to answer this one on your own. Is it 1, 12%, 2, 47%, 3, 78%, or D, 100%? What do you think the percentage of employees that want pension and benefits education? I imagine that's what most of you, when it comes to this kind of thing, deal with. So let's close that in 5, 4, 3, Two, one, bring up the results. Okay, 78% of 
is the big winner there. It's actually not. 87% of people want financial education, but only 47% of people want pension and benefits education. That's half, roughly. Roughly half the people only want pension and benefits education. So right off the bat, you guys are at a disadvantage. If you're going to do education for your employees, right off the bat, you're at a disadvantage. Because of all the people who want financial education, less than half want to participate in pension and benefits education. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges of pension education. So throughout the years that I've been doing financial education and I work with employees and helping them to deal with their finances, I ask them about their pensions and this type of thing and they say they've been to a pension session or they've participated in something online or um, you know, they've gone through their pension statements, but many times they tell me they just, they don't get it. They don't understand what the person is talking about. And they say, the person starts talking and I lose them. And I liken it to sitting in Charlie Brown's classroom where his teacher is sitting there talking to everyone, giving a great lesson, but what, is it, what are all the students hearing? What are all your members hearing? They're hearing wah, 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 wah. Okay? So how do we overcome that? A big part of it, I think, is changing our perspective on doing pension education. Here's how many people, many of the employees, and some of these pension sessions I've actually sat in on. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that this is what the feedback I get, is that the perspective of the company or the pension plan in doing pension education believes is everything's about the pension. We provide this fantastic benefit that's going to help these people in the future, going to make their lives better, and we look at it and the whole thought and the whole process is around the pension. Well, of course, retirement is a component of that, right? So you guys talk, I hope, a little bit about retirement and, you know, preparing for retirement. You probably likely talk about old age security and Canada pension plan and those types of issues. Uh, but when it comes down to the employee's finances, that's not really your department. In contrast to that, the people who are sitting in that room, even the people who are 55 plus, even the people who are a year away from retiring, have a completely different perspective. They're thinking finances. That's what they're thinking about. Okay? Their mind is just absolutely consumed about all the different day-to-day -day aspects of their finances. So much so that two-thirds of them are telling us that they're not in control of their finances. 60% of people say that personal finance is their number one stress. Okay? Now, retirement is a factor. They're thinking about retirement, and it's a larger factor than a lot of people might think. But when it comes down to the pension, the pension's really just a small aspect of it. It's not a big concern for these people. So we need to start talking to the employees more about addressing these issues that they're dealing with. So what are they dealing with? Principally, we know two-thirds aren't in control of their money, so a lot of them are sitting there going, oh my God, how do I get to the end of the month, let alone like uh, deal with my pension? And, oh, yeah, i got to make sure I get my debts paid. And, oh, geez, that's just, uh, they just keep going up. I can't seem to get ahead, right? And then it's the mortgage. Oh, i got to make sure I get my mortgage payment in. I can't afford to lose the house. And, oh, geez, and then there's the kid's education. And i got to deal with my, uh, make sure I've got some money set aside. Well, maybe I can't do that. So guess what? Maybe they're going to have to help out and do some work and set aside some of their own money to help pay for that education. What about living in life insurance? i got to make sure the family's protected in case something happens to me. And then, oh, geez, yeah, well, that reminds me. I've got to get the wills done. I haven't done my wills. As a matter of fact, more than 60% of people don't have wills. How many lawyers here do wills? Okay. <laughs> we'll have a sign-up sheet at the end for any of you that haven't got your wills yet. Okay. And then they're thinking about, okay, the wills, and oh, I wonder how mom and dad are doing. I wonder if they're going to be in, okay in retirement. And I'm get, am I going to have to help them out? 
Now, this may not be a reality for some of you sitting in this room, but again, put yourself in the mindset of the employee. Try and put yourself in their shoes because they may not be nearly as, for, uh, as fortunate as some of us in this room. Okay? Now, retirement is there. They're thinking about retirement. They want to deal with retirement. But one of the big problems that they have is, what am I going to do in retirement? When am I going to retire? How, uh, am I going to have enough money? But even if I have enough money, uh, what am I going to do? I, uh, I don't know what ret retirement looks like. Yeah, I've got to deal with that pension, uh, but I've got to make sure that I've got my taxes done and that's taken care of. And then, of course, you know, I've got to be investing the money somehow. I can't just leave it all sitting in a savings account. And who can help me with this? Where do I go to start? So one of the things we need to be thinking about is how do we clear these clouds out of the minds of the participants so that when you want to be talking about the pension and you want to be talking about the aspects of the pension, they're hearing your message. They can take that message and put it into context because now they understand their financial realities, how they're going to pay their bills, how they're going to deal with their debts, how they're going to put their kids through college, how they're going to take care of mom and dad. Part of that is understanding what is retirement going to look like. So to talk about what retirement is going to look like and how to get to that, I'm going to ask Gav to come up and talk to you. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> nice. We're not done. <laughs> he did his usual good job. Uh, my mic is on, I think. Yes, it is. Good. That's a good thing. You can read this as well as I can. I'd like to start out with a little bit of background as to how we got into uh, the educational field uh, dealing with retirement transition. As Frank mentioned when he uh, started, um, we each have complementary services and we decided that it would make a great deal of sense to put our services together to be able to offer a complete package he does the financial, I do the retirement transition, dealing with the psychological, the lifestyle issues, and the transition issues, obviously. So back in 19, uh, more years ago than I uh, can remember, I guess, I was uh, unceremoniously walked out the door of the company that I worked for. I had a corporate job, things were going well, uh, and as far as I was concerned, I was going to be there uh, until I retired. And the company got into some difficulty. New president was brought in, and he wanted his own team of people. Very common story. And myself and a whole bunch of other people lost our jobs. And for me, it was devastating. I hadn't realized how much of my sense of self-worth and self-image were tied up in my job in my position, in my title. And looking back on it, it was pretty silly. But at the time, it was a very difficult uh, situation. I'm sure there are people here in this room that can relate to that. So I wandered about for a couple of years, trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do the rest of my life. And slowly, it started to occur to me that if I was experiencing all these challenges with change, and transition, there must be thousands of people out there struggling with the same kinds of issues. So with that in mind and with the help of some very bright people, we started to build a program based on transition. And been doing that now for almost 18 years. Frank has been doing what he's been doing for I think 14 years and we obviously decided uh, to join forces. Here's a sampling of a few companies that we provide our uh, services to or uh, do business right across the country. And as educators, it's important that we are accredited, we are experienced, and we are unbiased. And we meet that uh, criteria without any problem whatsoever. This is a range of uh, services that we provide. The cornerstone is really the lifestyle transition process uh, that we've developed 
to help people figure out that vision uh, for their future, figure out their goals and objectives. Time for a drink. We made the decision, and obviously this was before I knew Frank, but in our company, the Retirement Education Center, we made the decision that we were going to not sell financial products, and we've stuck uh, with that for the past 18 years, and that's an important issue for companies. Many companies want to be very careful whether there's a hidden agenda uh, by the people that are providing the education, and uh, so we remain pure at this point, if I can say that. So what's in it for the employer? Why should the employer provide our kinds of programs? Well, there's a whole range of uh, potential payoffs, uh, stress, less use of benefits, um, employer liability, mitigating employer liability, job performance, and so on. Um, and I often get asked the question, well, how can your program help a company with those kinds of payoffs. And what it comes down to is control. And I hear this from human resource people as well, that when you've taught your employees a program or programs that help them take control over their life, it has a far-reaching effect. And there's a payoff to the bottom line of the organization. I love this quote. If you are what you do, then when you don't, you aren't. Um, and that sure applied to me, and I'm sure it applies to many people in this room, that your profession, your job, becomes part of who you are. And when that's taken away, psychologically, that can be a major problem for people, as I learned uh, myself. So there's a need for structure in one's life. And our transition process is really divided uh, into two parts. It's based on a step-by-step -step process that forces people to think their way through a wide range of issues and over time come to conclusions about what they want to do in the future. And the process helps them visualize and develop very clear goals and objectives. And then we help them understand the financial reality of the vision that they're developing. So on the one hand, you have your lifestyle issues. On the other hand, what's the price tag uh, for that lifestyle that you want? A very good friend of mine, some of you might know him, he's a retired actuary, uh, Patrick Longhurst. I know uh, a gentleman over here uh, knows him. And he was telling me about a conference he was at in Calgary. And the speaker was trying to define uh, how much is enough in retirement and was struggling with that issue. And this lady apparently stood up and said, well, doesn't it really come down to whether you want a villa in the south of France or a tar paper shack underneath the Don Valley Parkway? And that's an oversimplification, but it's very true. It depends on the lifestyle that you want. And that's why until you have figured out what that vision is, it's very difficult to put a price tag on how much is enough. So we begin with, in our approach and the foundation of what we've developed, we begin with helping people develop their vision, develop their goals and objectives, because without that, you can't know how much is enough. You know, you often hear in the news or in the newspapers, uh, oh, you need a million dollars to retire, or you need two million dollars. Uh, well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. It depends on your goals and objectives. So without that foundation of goals and objectives, the planning really is meaningless. And that's where our approach starts. This is a, a byline that we've been using since day one. You have to retire to something, not from something. And I'd like to give you an example uh, of that, if I might.
We did some work back a few years ago uh, for the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board, and they had on the table a very generous early retirement offer, and there were about 200 in the organization that qualified at the time, a mix of teachers, maintenance people, and staff people. And they made this offer, and they were shocked at how few took them up on their offer. And they figured, well, there must be a problem. We better find out what the problem is. They did a survey. The results of the survey said, and I'm paraphrasing, it's got nothing to do with money. It's got everything to do with, I've been a maintenance person or a staff person or a teacher for 25 or 30 years. I don't know anything else. I don't have alternatives. And until I can figure out what that is, I'm not retiring. I'm not going anywhere. So figuring out that vision, again, is a key issue for people. Now, traditional retirement, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is virtually non-existent. Back in my dad's day, and that was a very long time ago, uh, you got to 65, you had to retire. You had no choice. You got the handshake and the gold watch, and off into the sunset you went. Um, and the reality was that people tended to die young, a few years after retiring, because they put their feet up and didn't do anything. That's the way it was back then. The attitude was, why should I plan long term? I'm not going to be around to enjoy it. Today, the new retirement, if I can call it that, the new retirement is totally different. People are retiring younger, they're living longer, and now it's not inconceivable. You could have 20, 25 years or longer ahead of you in the next stages of your life. That's a long time to sit around and twiddle your thumbs. So you need to figure out that new structure uh, for yourself. And it can be almost anything. Today, the world is your oyster. The challenge is figuring out what it is that is going to challenge you uh, and satisfy you. And in order to do that, you need to take yourself through a process that forces you to think about all the issues. So we're going to do one of Frank's little polls here again. Um, so I ask you to, uh, the question is, what percentage of retirees will work on a part-time basis after retiring. And when I use uh, the word uh, work, I'm using work for pay or volunteering. They're both forms of work. One's for pay, one's for not. And I think you're using a lettering system. is a numbered system. And one is 10% and so on. You can read that for yourself. If you plug in your answer, and we'll get the results from this gentleman. Eighty-five percent is the correct. I can't see that. Yeah, there it is. Eighty-five percent is the correct answer. Uh, when we run our workshops, we do uh, some straw polls, and we've been doing this for many years. Um, and that number comes from those polls. The vast majority of people expect to continue working on some basis, whether it's volunteering or work for pay, because you need that structure. I don't know how many are in the room old enough to remember Alvin Toffler. Anybody remember Alvin? Yes. <laughs> well, we got a couple of old timers, <laughs> including myself. Uh, and one of the books he wrote was called The Third Wave. And in it, he talked about the fact that individuals need what he called life structure. And he described it in a very interesting way, that having a job is crucial psychologically over and above the paycheck. It provides an element of structure around which the rest of your life can be organized. And if you think about it, that's very true. The job is, the, for most people, the job is the focal point and the personal life revolves around the job. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, just a function of the culture that we live in. So we start to learn about structure at a very young age. 
And when you're a child, your structures, your parents, your family, your neighborhood, your school, your friends, and you get comfortable in that structure. And then years later, you get out into the working world, and now who's calling the tune on structure? It's your employer, your hours of work, your responsibilities, your accountabilities, and again, you get comfortable in that structure. And then you get to a stage in your life where hopefully you can do what you want. You can transition into retirement. The problem is that the vast majority of people haven't figured out what they want to transition to, what's going to motivate them, challenge them, and so on. I'd like to tell you a little personal story. A very good friend of mine, his name is David, gave me permission to use his story. And uh, he was a partner in a, a pension consulting firm in Toronto. Uh, we were having breakfast together one morning a few years back. And over breakfast, he said to me, he said, Av, guess what? I'm going to retire. And I said, David, that's wonderful. What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to play more golf. My wife and I are going to travel some more. Now, basically, we're going to put our feet up and enjoy life. And they did for about six months. We call that the honeymoon period. And by the end of six months, he was absolutely bored out of his mind. No reason to get out of bed, nothing to challenge him. Life was meaningless for him. So he knew he had to build a new structure. He went back to work on a part-time basis, consulting in his field. He started up a hobby, he did some volunteering, they did play some more golf and travel. Bottom line, they built a series of activities that gave meaning back to his life. So that when the alarm clock went off in the morning, he was ready to get up and get on with life. What about your work and life motivators? Here's a list, a partial list. And some of these apply to everybody. Um, do you think that because you're going to retire tomorrow morning, these motivators disappear? They don't. They're a part of who you are. And they need to be satisfied. This is pretty heavy stuff, so it's time for a chuckle. Everybody read that? I don't hear much chuckling. That's the old retirement. That's not the new retirement. Not unusual for somebody to come up to me and say, Av, given X amount of dollars, can I afford to retire? And my answer is always the same, that unfortunately it's not the right question. These are the kinds of questions, we call them the real questions, that need to be answered. And there's a whole host of them, more than, more than these. Um, and this is where developing the vision and the goals and objectives start. And I ask you to envisage yourself sitting at your kitchen table with a clean sheet of paper trying to answer questions like these. Most people after half an hour or so, we'll still have a clean sheet of paper. There's no direction, there's no con context to it, no step-by-step -step, uh, process. So we've sort of summarized the recipe for a satisfying retirement into three parts. Um, vision, that's where it all starts, that's where the planning starts. You have to be able to relate your vision to your finances. So it starts with the vision, with the goals and objectives. Part of that is also developing a structure of what you're going to do in retirement or the next stage of your life. And maybe it's not retirement. Maybe it's a new career, a new job, or starting up a little business. But you need structure. And then you need the game plan to put it into action. And for us, that means finding the balance 
between here's my vision, here's my lifestyle goals, here's my financial reality, and now I understand how to get a fit uh, between the two. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Frank, and we're drawing to a close, as you'll be glad to hear. So as I've mentioned, it's about creating that vision, having that understanding of what the future may look like, working through the process and understanding, you know, what am I going to do with my life? It's only once you have that vision, once you have that understanding and those clear goals and objectives, then can you start figuring out the finances. So finances, you know, the pensions are definitely a component of that, but a big part of it, it needs to start, first start with that vision. So I just want to briefly take a, about three minutes to talk to you a little bit about what is financial education. Back in October of last year, uh, we hosted a round table of industry experts to talk about what is financial education in the workplace. So this is the shiny photo of us all. First gentleman there on the left is uh, Gary Rabier. He's the president of the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education. Then there's Tom Hamza, who's the president of the Investors Education Fund. We have Lana Thompson with the Financial Planner Standards Council. Ophelia Isabel with Towers Watson. I know some of you who are here from Towers Watson likely know Ophelia. Uh, Marie Donnelly from Aon Hewitt. Again, I think a few people here from Aon. Lori Campbell, who is the CEO of Credit Canada. Uh, Debt Solutions and was a member of the Canadian Task Force on Financial Literacy. Uh, Jane Rooney, who is the Director of Financial Literacy for the Financial Consumers Agency of Canada. Uh, Donald Stewart, the former CEO and Sun, uh, of Sun Life and the Chairman of the Task Force on Financial Literacy. And, of course, myself on the end there. And what we did is we sat around uh, for the day very much like this, but at a round table, um, and talked about what is financial education? What should it be including? What should be covered? How does that, uh, like, why should companies be doing this? Why should be, uh, what are the benefits to the companies? What are the benefits to the employees? And how do you go about implementing a financial education program and a lifestyle transitioning program? Companies are in business to be in business. They're not in business to provide financial education. So what we did is we took a lot of the information from those round tables and we put it into a series of white papers just to make it a little easier to read and so that there's a way to get that information. So the first white paper is what it talks about what is employee financial education. The second one is why provide financial education. And the third one is a 10-step guide to implementing it. In your binders, there's a page there, you can go, there's a website address, you can go and download all these white papers. Uh, you just go to that website, you can download a copy of these white papers. There's also a quick response code if you know how to use a, uh, those QR code readers on your phones. You just scan that and you can go in and download those. So we provide those resources for you to help you answer a lot of the questions. So I'm not going to take the time today to go through all of it. Just some of the key messages that came out. One of the principal key messages was that when it comes to financial education in the workplace, it needs to be about more than just pensions. Principal reason for that, pension education really seems to only attract or have people who are of a certain demographic participating. That means that you have a very small percentage of your overall employee or plan membership that are participating and engaging in it. As a matter of fact, this is uh, the... Uh, 2012 uh, CAP members guide um, survey that they do. I'm sure mo many of you read this uh, from Benefits Canada. Um, they say here that members haven't upped their usage of the various communications tools and services available. As a matter of fact, um, there was a, a drop in the number of attendees in education sessions, a drop of 24% year over year, participating in pension education sessions. Okay, it dropped from 17% to a meager 13% of members participating in these things. So we need to make sure that if we're going to be providing financial education, it needs to address all the employees and not just the plan members, and not just the 
demographic of 55 plus, pardon me. The other issue was is that many of the people in attendance have greater financial concerns. As I talked about earlier, they've got all these other issues swirling around in their heads. And if we don't first address those issues, then we can't get them to focus and understand and take the information that you're trying to provide to them and put it into context that they can use. Okay, you guys, uh, many pension and benefits people are spending a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort developing tools, developing the best pension statements that there are out there, talking about all these different resources to help engage the plan members, when in reality what's going to engage the most is allowing them to clear their minds and their thoughts around all their uh, financial issues so that they can focus and take this information and put it into context. struggling as well. So the, me the, the real question is how do we get the message across what? to employers? To employers. That a lot of their <laughs> plan members are... are their this is why I'm here talking to you guys today. <laughs> uh, this is a big part of my challenge is c getting employers to learn and to understand. How do we get employers to be thinking about this and dealing with these issues that employees have and uh, the issue of you know, 25% being financially distressed and two-thirds not being in control of their finances and addressing that issue to be able to better communicate their pensions and, and their fiduciary re responsibilities around that. Is that about right? Yeah. And, I, I, again, uh, go tell everybody <laughs> about it. Um, I spend a lot of my time just trying to get the word out there. Um, I'm working with the Conference Board of Canada. We're working to get some messages out through those avenues. But uh, speaking to groups like this and other areas, this is, uh, you know, it, it, it is very much a grassroots effort to get companies to be thinking about it. And, you know, as pension plan members, one of the strong things you can do is to go out and talk to your members. What are your big concerns? And survey them. Okay? That may be just go out and share to them what are your big financial concerns and get that feedback and, uh, and, and figure it out. Talk to the EAPs um, as well. We'll come in and do that evaluation as a third-party independent group to help you if you need be. But one of the other issues that a lot of people who are sitting in those pension sessions have is, you know, that they never take action with this information. And again, it, the reason is, is that they've got all these other issues they're still trying to deal with. So they can't use that information because they can't understand how to use that information in context to their financial lives. A big part of the communications needs to be educational, okay? Not just information. Okay, you need to be educating these people and not just giving them a brochure or providing them with a tool or a resource. Favorite quote, of course, we all know this one, you can give a man a fish and feed him for a day or you can teach a man to fish and feed him for a life. Just hammers home the point that information is something that is given. Education is something that is taught. So producing the greatest pension statements there are out there doesn't do anything to educate the member. It goes to the line of giving them information. You may meet your legal requirements and your CAP compliance rules, but has it really done anything to further the participation and engagement of the members in the programs, in the pensions? Something else from the round table was is that we need to go back and start with the basics. Financial education needs to take a step back and say, what are the, uh, the things that most people need to address and deal with? This is just a summary of some of them. But again, principally, what came out of that round table is that we need to start with goals, starting with a vision, like I've talked with. Whether it's a ver vision for retirement or whether it's a vision for um, your here and now, you know, dealing with the next, you know, two years of your life, trying to figure out how you put your kids into college. It needs to start with that vision in order for you to then address it. 
The other thing was is that it needs to be an educator. I talked a little bit about this. So we've done surveys of uh, hundreds of companies and thousands of employees, and we've asked them, how important is it that the person doing financial education be accredited, meaning know what they're talking about, standing in front of that group and communicating it? Now, if you're in HR, I don't want to sound, I don't want to be critical here, but many of you are not financial educators. Many of you don't have the skills, the resources, the knowledge necessary to be able to communicate these concepts and to be able to answer the questions of the audience. When we did our survey, 80% of employees and 82% of companies said that it was a very to extremely important that the person be accredited. We asked them how important is it that the person be experienced at delivering uh, education. 86% of employees and 87% of companies stated that it was very to extremely important that these people be experienced. And we asked them how important is that the people be unbiased, meaning not standing in front of your employees selling a product. And again, the numbers were huge. 87% of employees and 88% of companies said that if somebody is going to be there delivering a financial education, lifestyle transitioning program, it's important that they're not there positioning or selling a product. Very too extremely important. So from the round table, we came out of it with you know, a series of topics and issues that need to be addressed. And you know, whether it's setting your vision and knowing your goals to knowing your financial reality to understanding where your money's coming from. Where's my money going? And, oh my goodness, life insurance is so crazy. How do I understand that? And how am I going to deal with that and those realities? Um, sure, retirement is definitely one aspect of it, um, but you know, having things such as wills, powers of attorney, and personal care directives, these critical documents that have such a massive impact on the financial reality of those that need it when an event happens. It needs to be there. It needs to be part of this. Of course, that last slide, finding the right advisor. This is a question I get more often than not. Who can I go to to get help on this stuff? Okay. There's a myriad of other topics that you can also address, of course, you know, elder care, registered disability savings plans, education savings plans. There's been lots of talk about the fact that most people don't understand uh, RESPs, education savings plans. They've been around forever. But one of the things that came out of it is, is that you need to first create, from the round table, uh, you need to first start by creating an understanding of the needs and the wants of the employees. How do you get the employees to participate and engage in a financial education program? How do you do that? Well, the overall message, and in our 10-step guide, there's 10 steps about implementing a program effectively, but one of the key messages was about creating an inductive situation. And what I mean by that is creating a situation that gets people excited and wanting to participate in this education and get this information. Clearly, people really aren't that excited about pension with about 13% of them showing up for these things. Okay? So how do we get them excited? Well, figure out what is their greatest pressing need. Let's have a session on that. So a lot of people are suffering from debt. Maybe that's what it is. But first start by going out to your members and finding out. What are your big issues? What are the th is uh, things? And don't just ask about the pension. Ask about all those other issues that they're struggling with as well. little chuckle to wrap up here. I did this at the age of 30. <laughs> All right. So that's what we have for you today. There's a ton of resources and more information in these white papers that you can just go to and download. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, we'll take some quick questions. And I've got a couple of books, a couple more books here. If you were lucky to get a book, I'm happy to sign it for you uh, uh, afterwards. If you want to come by, I'll sign a copy of the book for you. If you weren't as lucky to get a book, you can get it at Amazon or Chapters. Or <laughs> no.